Hello and good morning everyone and thank you for joining our Mimecast targeted threat protection webinar today. Uh, so we're joined here by Steve Malone from Mimecast and also Orlando Scott Cowley from Mimecast and they'll be going through the webinar with you today. Thanks very much Amy. Um, hi everyone, this is Orlando from uh, Mimecast and as I said, I'm joined by my colleague Steve Malone as well. Um, we are going to run you through the latest advanced uh, threats that will appear in your inbox and uh, then Steve will give you some, some clues as to how you can solve those problems. Um, if you'd like to follow us along on Twitter, you can do. Our Twitter handles are on there. Um, and I guess we could also take some questions at the end or, or you can ask us questions via Twitter or via email. That's fine. Um, so to start with, let's have a look at the threat landscape. What's really going on with the email threat landscape right now because years ago we used to talk about spam and virus and that's, that's a problem which is still there but being dealt with very well and lots of the latest threats that are occurring are bypassing traditional anti-spam, antivirus gateways and they're ending up on the desktop and the first that your IT team or if you're an administrator, the first you know about it is when you get an alert from your uh, desktop antivirus and uh, um, that's even if that system is sophisticated enough to actually detect the threat and many of these threats will even bypass desktop antivirus as well. In uh, an email context, we know that it takes about 1 minute 22 seconds uh, as the median time for a uh, first click, someone in your organization to click on a, a link or an attachment in a, a spear phishing attack or a, um, any type of advanced email attack. I use the phrase fish here interchangeably. We're, we're, when we say fish, we're talking about spear phishing. Um, and I'll also include in that definition for, for the sake of this discussion, uh, advanced attacks like macro threats, ransomware, um, anything that can be deployed to your desktop via an email. Um, and uh, 1 minute 22 seconds is pretty quick and that's the median time. So if you imagine what the lower end outliers are, um, you've, you've essentially got no chance. If these things get past your existing gateway, um, they're onto the desktop and into the user's uh, inbox before you know it. Uh, what we do so also know, thanks to the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report, which is a, a fantastic read by the way if you if you're interested in this sort of stuff, that 95% of all of the most recent incidents, the big hacks that you read about in the press, have all started with a phishing email of some sort, a spear phishing email of some description. Um, I've just put an example in there on the left. Uh, you'll notice that the most uh, simple, or, or these attacks in their simplest form, are simply a, a URL, and the user clicks on the URL, and that takes them to a compromised website or a malware-laden website. And, uh, and their machine is compromised, and most recently that's probably a ransomware attack, which, which uh, you've probably read about in the press, but we'll come on to slightly later on. The result, of course, is that you get breached, um, and that's everyone's biggest fear right now. If you're an IT team, you're an IT manager, you're a CISO, CSO, your biggest fear is having to tell the organization that something has got in and your network is, is, is been compromised. Um, this particular breach saw, uh, if you recognize that picture, saw about 37 million um, people details being leaked onto the internet and that's a secondary problem is that if you have any interesting data intellectual property uh, personal information credit card data anything that can be sold or traded or used against uh, you or your customers that then is, is exfiltrated out of the organization as, as well and we've seen that in lots of the, the, the attacks that go on um, and I've got a couple of examples of, of different types of attack that we'll, we'll show you today the impact of the breach for uh, organizations is costly. There's no denying that. If you're a small organization, the impact can be fatal. Um, Ponemon's 2015 Global Cost of Data Breach report put the average cost per breach at $6.5 million, which is a pretty big number. Um, but what we do here is we struggle to really get a good, uh, a good indication of what that cost is to you as an organization. So what I say to IT teams is sit down and work out what is your most valuable data and if you think well we don't really have any you probably do because it'll be your your intellectual property your customer database maybe your your staff records uh, your CRM solution if any of that was taken away from you or taken offline or perhaps leaked to the internet what would that cost be to you so there's the cost of recovering uh, there's the cost of cleaning up afterwards there's the, the associated PR and, and, and media management cost as well um, and it does add up, it, it, it gets quite significant and I've got a few examples coming up slightly later on. Um, now here's a couple of other big numbers, the ubiquity attack is a, uh, a watershed attack um, when we talk about 
advanced threats and email. Um, this was one of the first public um, disclosures of a whaling attack or a business email compromise attack, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, but Ubiquity Networks lost $48 million in that whaling attack. And if you know what whaling is, you'll know it's a wire transfer fraud attack. Uh, someone simply wire transferred $48 million in, in big chunks to the cyber criminals. And we found out recently that the uh, $100 million attack has just been announced in the press, but uh, we don't yet know who that is. Um, another style of attack was a, and a compromise through a, a third party. Target, a couple of, well, actually getting on for five years ago now, um, was a uh, compromise through a third party. But the reason I include this is not because of the numbers there on the screen, those 162 million liability on the screen, but because it's such a fantastic case study. Uh, if you want to see exactly how these attacks play out, there's been so much forensic analysis done on the target attack that you can use that to... Uh, you can see exactly what the attackers did, how they got into the organization, how they exfiltr exfiltrated the data. And also in a business context, you can see what the impact was to target. Um, the CEO uh, left, the, C the CIO left, um, the impact to their share prices is significant. Um, so there are many different ways we can use that target attack. And again, I would say that's a watershed style of attack in, in this particular space. And then of course, closer to home, Sony Pictures Entertainment. I include this one because it cost them pretty much off of the bat $35 million in repairs. And you'll all remember this attack because you will have seen the screenshots and the pictures of, of uh, pieces of paper stuck on monitors saying, please do not log into the network or access the Wi-Fi. Um, and that was the immediate reaction to that attack is that whilst they try and work out what's going on, you essentially have to stop your users using your infrastructure. So your, your business... Uh, unless it can carry on without your IT infrastructure, is is effectively um, offline. It's effectively down for a day or two, uh, or, or even weeks if uh, if it takes a while to sort the problem out. Now, the reason all of this is happening, as I mentioned, is because all of that uh, data and all of the access that cyber criminals get to networks that they compromise is valuable. And there's a black market for personal information, for health insurance information, credit card data, intellectual property. Uh, even customer lists um, and, and client lists are valuable to, to your closest competitors. And that sort of data is sold and traded on the, uh, on the, on the dark web, um, on sites like Alphabay, if, uh, if you come across that. I wouldn't recommend trying to find that at work. Uh, it may get you in trouble. Um, but it's funding cybercrime, and it's funding the nastiest parts of, of society. Um, there's no, there should be no doubt about the purpose of these attacks. It's to, it's to raise money for terrorism and all of the, the horrible things that go on in the world. Um, so there's a, there's a uh, almost an industrialization that's gone on here in the cybercrime market. Um, we used to talk about hacking about by um, uh, using the example of a, a teenager in a bedroom somewhere, and they, they're, they're trying to get press coverage or column inches, or, or, or they're trying to win favor amongst other, other hackers in their uh, organizations. But now it's an industrial complex. There are organizations that are cybercrime organizations that have uh, corporate headquarters. They have health insurance policies. They have um, lunch breaks for their staff who work nine to five. Uh, and they go on, uh, on corporate uh, team building events. Um, and to those people, it's just a job, but their output is, is cybercrime, and they're after data, and they're after access to networks that can get them data. Um, doom and gloom, sadly. Um, now, how do they get in? Well, when it comes to owning your, your, uh, your organization, your network, your users, the entrance to your business is sadly very obvious. Um, there are many different ways that hackers can get in, and lots of those are quite complex. So if you think about things like network style attacks, uh, all of the glamorous stuff that we read about in the press of hacking bits of hardware and, and gaining network access are quite hard to do. Sending someone an email is relatively simple uh, and it's relatively cheap. So we started off at the beginning with that statistic that 95% of breaches start with a fish. Uh, what we also know is, uh, and remember a fish could be spear phishing, classic phishing, it could be a weaponized attachment attack, that sort of thing. Um, 23% of people that receive that message will open open it and they'll click on the link. Now, I believe that's a pretty low number, but Verizon have told us that's the, the figure they arrived on last year, 2015. Uh, we also know that 11% of people will run the attachment. Uh, and again, I think that's a, a pretty low number. Um, when we talk to IT managers and CSOs and CISOs in organizations, they tell them that when they 
uh, suffer these attacks, the, the impact is significant, but also the range of individuals that were, were taken in by these attacks is across the business, it's everybody. Um, it's, it's, it's people in the IT team, HR team, finance team, the executive team, uh, everybody falls for it because they're so well put together and that's, a, that's one of the biggest problems that we'll, we'll talk about in a second. The result, sadly, is this. We call it being pawned or being owned or being popped. There are numerous ways of, of doing it. Remember, it, the mean time to, to the first click in a phishing attack was 1 minute 22 seconds. Um, this really, face palm is the only response. Uh, your, your poor IT guys, are, when they find out these things, that's all they can do is put their head in their hands because the network's already been compromised. Um, it, you, you can't necessarily fight these things off at the gateway uh, without extra technology that we'll come on to, like you can with things like a denial of service attack. Uh, those type of attacks, network-based attacks, can be dealt with upstream of your organization, but email-based advanced threats, uh, once you find out about it, have got into your network already. Now, the Mandy and M-Trends report is quite uh, a good one to read as well, because that gives us um, a length of time. Over the past few years, it's given us a length of time as to the number of days that uh, it takes for those attacks to, to be detected in, in a network. Last year it was 205 days. Uh, now that is on its way down. I believe it's come down from about 243 days in 2012. So we are getting better. But you'll see on the, on the calendar there that almost half of that year is shaded red. That's 205 days from the 1st of January to the 24th of July. Now, as an ex network admin um, and security administrator, it terrified the life out of me to think that there was someone on my network for half an hour, uh, let alone half a year. Um, and you can imagine what damage someone has done when they've got into a corporate network and they've been roaming around from January to July. Um, sadly, very often at that 205 day point, you're told about that attack by somebody else. Um, whether it's the Secret Service or FBI or GCHQ or UK CERT or one of the CERT organizations, someone comes to you and says, we found your data on the internet. Um, you probably want to check what's going on on your, your, your systems and your network. Um, we also know that about 70% of the attacks that have a clear motive lead on to a secondary target. Uh, and if you think, if you're in the type of business that has a, a customer base or a client base, um, and the example I like to use here are, are law firms because law firms have many interesting customers and some of whom are very high profile. They could be celebrity divorce cases, they could be defense contractors. You're just a stepping stone into those, those more high profile organizations. So the attackers are using your organization as a stepping stone or a pivot into their, their target. And what they'll do is they'll take out any interesting data they can find on the way through or they'll leave that access available uh, for, for future use or they'll sell the access from your network um, as a, a, a connection laundered facility, so a clean connection if you like, so other cybercrime gangs can buy that connection, they can use it and they can do all sorts of stuff appearing to be uh, your infrastructure on the, net, on the internet. Uh, so email threats specifically uh, I want to, to talk about because as I said it's easy to send an email, it's very easy to um, fire up a, an email account somewhere uh, and just send a few it's a malicious email. Um, you can buy the malware on the internet, you can buy the, the malware laid on website, you can buy the phishing, uh, spear phishing links and feeds, that's all available to buy on the dark web. Uh, it even comes with a support contract so you can get 24-7 support on your malware which, uh, which uh, is another part of their business. Um, I mentioned phishing earlier on, as I said we're talking about financial fraud, we're talking about network access uh, through compromised desktops which have, have been drawn in by a, a URL perhaps or a weaponized attachment in a message. Um, and I'm also going to talk a bit about whaling as well and give you an example of, of uh, how whaling works. If you come across whaling, um, it's sometimes used, uh, sometimes called CEO fraud or business email compromise as well. And that's the type of attack which is a financial uh, orientated fraud. Now all of these attacks are very well researched and targeted. The, the, the attackers use social media tools like LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter or Google Plus to research you and your organizations and they'll spend a fair few months building up an accurate picture of their target. And if you think about LinkedIn, it's an amazing spear phishing database. It contains uh, pretty much your organizational chart. It contains everybody in your business. Uh, probably most of the professional individuals in the Western world are listed in, in, uh, in LinkedIn and you can build a very 
clear picture of um, a business, who reports to who, who are the senior managers uh, inside an organization. So the attackers know this and they use that data to um, make their attacks more convincing. So the research that comes in means they can craft emails that look a bit like this one. Uh, they will use your name because they know your name, they've done the research, they know the, uh, that they found you on all of their social media sites. Uh, if they're using an attachment in this attack, they will call it something, uh, it will be usually a spreadsheet or a Word document. Uh, the, we the, the most common form of weaponized attachment is a Word document containing a malicious macro. Uh, and they'll put something in that that's going to get your attention, so probably about a salary or a raise or redundancy. Uh, they may put in some other problem which, which is there really to get your blood boiling, to, to make, grab your attention. It's all, it's all social engineering. It's all there to make sure you're reading that, uh, that message. And then they'll sign it off from your boss because they know who your boss is. So they got that from LinkedIn, remember? Uh, they know who your HR department are, your finance team. They know all of those people. Um, and uh, there's an example there I just uh, I, I popped up on the screen there. This one contains a malicious PDF. Um, but you'll see that uh, I just found that one on the internet a, a while ago. Um, the outcome is that, that you're, you're, you're drawn in um, to their attack. Now, I mentioned Word documents being a particular problem. What we've seen more recently uh, is a move away from classic spear phishing links in messages because the attackers know that we know their tactics. And we always talk about this arms race, this red queen effect, if you like, of having to stay well ahead of the attackers. So they've moved on. And they're using malicious macros now to download uh, content. So you all will have seen this security warning when you open up an Office document. Um, and it's a document that contains a macro. And, and luckily, Microsoft, have, have, in the most recent versions of uh, Office 2013 and above, I believe, have disabled the, the capability that runs those macros automatically and prompts the user to run them themselves. But the attackers know this, so they put in a nice big warning, and again, this is a real version, uh, a nice warning to say that um, you need to enable the content to actually be able to read that message, which is total rubbish. Uh, if the content was in the Word document, you'd be able to see it without enabling the macro. All the macro does is, is do some funky uh, automation, uh, um, very popular in spreadsheets by finance teams, which is why attackers target finance teams, because these guys run macros every day, and they, they think nothing of enabling that content. Sadly, what the macro does is call off to a website somewhere in Russia or China or the Philippines or some other part of the world and download the malware to the desktop. Now, the reason they do this is because the macro itself is not malicious, so it can bypass traditional uh, antivirus gateways because it's not signatureable. And the way you can obfuscate the, the URL for downloading the file within the macro uh, are numerous and quite complex. So it's an easy way to get um, into in front of the user and actually get the user to do the dirty work for them, uh, which is a, which is a great uh, a great tactic. So. Disabling macros across the board is something that we'd always advise, or certainly making sure that you're telling your end users about this threat is also something we'd advise. Um, here's a, a, an example that was popping around uh, not so long ago. This one is um, uh, an example, an invoice from uh, the Apple Store in Manchester. If you have access to a spam quarantine, um, you will see that there's lots of invoice style emails floating around at the moment. All of those are, are this type of attack. Now, what we've noticed is the macro itself is, has moved on as well. Those are starting to download ransomware or, or crypto malware. Uh, and when you're affected by that, this is the type of thing that you'll see on your screen. Um, this is uh, a warning from the uh, Locky ransomware, which actually, incidentally has just had its um, encryption broken, which is good news. But ransomware effectively, once your users uh, downloaded that onto their desktop unknowingly through that macro, it encrypts everything on their machine. It then looks for network shares and encrypts everything on the network shares. Uh, and some of them are so advanced they'll even encrypt all of the actual the hard drive itself. Um, the name ransomware is, as, and as you can see if you're reading this, suggests that you have to pay a ransom to decrypt the data. There's been a lot of debate about whether you should or shouldn't pay the ransom. I'd always advise don't pay it for several reasons. One, you're, you're negotiating with terrorists, effectively. Uh, two, you're, there's no guarantee the data will be decrypted. Um, three, a lot of the infrastructure that you can see in the middle of this page on, uh, on the dark web, those Tor to web or those onion addresses on the middle there, is very often taken down by security companies. So by the time you get around to paying the ransom, 
the private key for the uh, encryption used for your data may not exist. So you may end up paying for nothing. The only real way to get around these is to either hope that the encryption is broken by someone, which for Lockheed it has been just recently, uh, or to restore from backup. But a lot of these ransomware services are encrypting backups as well because um, uh, backup services run with the same user permissions on the network that um, the user is, is, uh, is using on their desktop. So make sure you change that as well to ensure that the backup can't be overwritten too. Um, sorry state of affairs. Now we mentioned social engineering earlier on. Social engineering is how a lot of this is being done now. Um, it's a clever manipulation of the natural human tendency to trust uh, we all want to help someone, we all want to, to make someone's life easier. So when you get an email from someone claiming to need help or, or asking you to do something, generally you follow through on it. Um, the problem here is that social engineering is a lifetime study. Uh, all of these books here are, are, are great reading and if you haven't read any of them, I'd recommend that you pick a couple and read them. Uh, you can use them um, in any, any uh, part of your life and in fact the Ian Mann book there, Hacking the Human, not that I'm recommending it, comes with a, um, a tip on getting uh, first class train travel with a standard class ticket. Um, so you can see it's not only used by hackers, it's used by uh, psychologists, it's used by uh, marketers and advertisers, but the social engineering is now so good by cyber criminals, uh, it's convincing our end users to do all sorts of uh, wonderful stuff. And most recently the wire transfer fraud problem whaling in particular has become the real issue uh, because the cyber criminals are tricking our end users into transferring money to their, their accounts. Now Gartner tell us that um, protection against targeted phishing attacks remain the most critical inbound protection. Uh, but what we have to do is realize that these attacks now no longer contain any payload. There's no malware in there. There's no link. There's no URL. There's no uh, weaponized attachment. They're effectively malwareless attacks because they're relying purely on social engineering. Um, whaling, as I mentioned earlier, is sometimes called business email compromise or CEO fraud or W2 fraud. Uh, you would have read about some of those, those popular attacks. I've got some examples coming up. Um, that's what they're after. They're, they're after money uh, and or, or W2 uh, are the tax uh, forms in the US that employees get, a bit like P60s in this country. Um, they're after personal details that will give them access to money uh, or tax refunds in this case. And they use um, social engineering to get that. Here are a few examples that have happened recently. Uh, Seagate and um, Snapchat were, were W2 frauds. Uh, so quite high profile companies have been hit by this. And the list goes on. There's, there's a long list of people who've been, been hit. And it's either, as I said, details of people or money. Uh, um, as I said earlier, we found out recently that one in one organization, we don't know who yet, has been has been hit by a hundred million dollar whaling uh, fraud. And that's just done through a wire transfer. The biggest sum we've come across is ten million dollars in one wire transfer. Um, and that's a significant amount of money. But if you're a cyber criminal, it's easy money because you're just sending an email. You're just telling someone to, to pretending to be the CFO or the CEO and saying, I need this wire transfer done really quickly. It's all really about a matter of truth and what we believe um, truth is. And we said earlier social engineering is about our ability to, to, or to our human nature to want to trust people. But truth, if you look at the definition, is about um, a fact or belief which we accept to be true. And when the cyber criminals are tricking us into believing the email they're sending is from the CFO or the CEO, which is the tactic they use in the whaling attack, we believe that's true because we A, we want to help people and we look at that message and we say, well, it, it, it appears to be from the CFO. It's got his name on it or her name on it. Um, it mentions that they're on holiday right now, which is why they can't do this themselves. And I know they're on holiday um, because because I work with them. Uh, the attackers also know the CFO is on holiday because they've seen some of the details on, on maybe Twitter or, or Facebook. Um, so on the face of it, everything looks true. So we, this is why we fall for it. Uh, Here's lots of other examples, um, big numbers there. You'll see that uh, lots of people falling for these types of attacks all the time. And these are just the ones we know about. Um, the FBI give us some even more alarming figures that they estimate losses of uh, up to $1.2 billion um, reported across 50 states and 79 countries around the world. Uh, Minecraft, our own research, research shows a 270% increase in these type of attacks since January 2015. Um, the cyber criminals are turning to whaling style attacks uh, as being their number one attack of choice because, as I said, it doesn't require any malware to, uh, to, to propagate that attack. Now, here's an example. 
if you look very carefully. Um, I've, I've changed some of these details slightly. The domain names are changed slightly, but the actual emails you'll see in a second are real. Uh, if you look at the domain name at the top, uh, they both appear to be from any-company.com, but the one from a hacker is uh, very slightly different, but on first glance, it looks the same. But if you look really closely, you'll notice that the R and the N in company, or sorry, the M in company has been replaced with R and N to look like an, an M. Uh, there is a technical description for this, uh, horological, I can't remember it, I'll have to look it up and let you know later. Uh, but when you look at that really quickly, if it's the end of the quarter, end of the month, um, you think, yeah, that's fine, I'll, I'll, that, that looks real. Um, that's a tactic that the cyber criminals are using here. Um, they're registering domains very quickly that look and feel a lot like your own domain name. Um, you could use two Vs for a W, uh, you could use an uppercase uh, I for an L. Um, homoglyph is the word I'm looking for, it's just popped into my mind. Um, they're homoglyph attacks, uh, you can Google those and there's a, a very long list of these. Um, the attackers know that as well. And they may even put in extra characters in a domain name that looks just like yours. Again, the, the aim here is to trick your users into thinking this is real. Uh, when they send the message, there'll be an initial contact which will be appearing to be from the CFO or the CEO, which is why we call it CEO fraud. And it will be very friendly. I need you to do something. Are you in the office? Uh, perhaps mention they're on holiday or I'm out of the office at a conference. Um, again, because they, the attackers saw the guy tweet something about a conference he was at. Um, now, the, the interesting thing here is when the finance team who are hit by these attacks get these messages, they very often reply, uh, and the attackers sat waiting for that reply. So the response comes back, um, yeah, I need you to send a wire transfer. I mean, it, it could be a batch transfer, a chaps transfer, it could be uh, I need you to send me all of our P60 data, all of our W2 data. Um, the attackers send that when they know they've got contact with someone inside your organization. Usually a finance team, usually an HR team, these are people with access to that style of data. Uh, and that conversation can happen over three or four different messages. So they're very live, very real-time real, real -time attacks. Um, but notice there's no link in there, there's no attachment. So these are all uh, very simple style attacks. Now, the protection against this is, is, uh, is available, luckily. Um, as I mentioned, lots of these attacks do get past your existing gateways. So we have to start thinking about a defense in depth for email security. Now, there's a danger when I talk about defense in depth that you think, well, the 90s will phone and want its security strategy back because we don't talk about that anymore. We talk about the, the perimeter being dead. We talk about our networks being dirty. Um, we talk about zero trust. But what I mean by defense is not just the technology. It, it's got to be about the people as well. You've got to include the people. So as I um, hand over to, your, to, to Steve here, um, our security product manager, um, my moment of enlightenment for you today is to think about those layers of protection. And Steve's going to go into some of those in a bit more detail now. So Steve. Great. Thank you very much, Orlando. Um, so as you can see, you know, this is... Um, this is a, a very dynamic and, and scary threat, uh, threat landscape. Um, you know, really uh, keep in mind those stats that Orlando shared earlier in the presentation. 95% uh, of breaches start with a, a phishing email. Uh, that's, that represents a huge threat to an organization of any size. Um, and what I want to share with you now is Mimecast's approach to um, helping organizations protect themselves against um, this very, very real threat. Um, so Mimecast provides um, a set of products and services which we call targeted threat protection. And really we've aligned those services to directly deal with the issues and the problems and the threats that Orlando mentioned. So I want to run you through each of those service components and show you how um, each piece can help protect the organization. So within the targeted threat protection suite, we have three individual service layers, uh, URL protect, attachment protect, and impersonation protect. So as I'm going through this, just think back to uh, what Orlando has already shared with you. Um, so URL protect uh, will help to protect the organization against the kind of phishing emails that contain a link, so something that a user would be encouraged to click that would open a web browser, uh, take them to a website, and ask them maybe to put in a password or credentials, or maybe even download malware. Attachment Protect is designed to uh, prevent 
the kind of weaponized attachments that uh, we see a, a huge volume of um, from affecting end users. And these are specifically um, things like PDFs, Microsoft Office files, so what we call productivity files. They're, they're the kind of files that, um, as an administrator, you can't block users from sending and receiving. Um, things like .exe files, MSI files, script files. Those kind of files, which are now very much associated with more traditional viruses, tend to just be blocked at the gateway. It's unusual for um, uh, an end user to need to send and receive those kind of files. But users do need to send things like PDFs or Word documents or Excel spreadsheets. So attackers know this, and that's why they're using um, techniques like macros or embedded code to weaponize those attachments. Um, and the, uh, the real issue is that an end user will perceive those file types as being safe. So attachment protect deals with those. And then finally, impersonation protect. Um, and that is uh, the part of the service that directly deals with the whaling or business email compromise emails that Orlando showed you. And each of these components have um, some unique features. So I want to run through these in a little more detail and we'll take a look first at URL Protect. So essentially URL Protect, um, as mentioned, will protect from links in emails. And we do this by rewriting those links in all inbound emails. So as mails pass through Mimecast, we, uh, we change any link inside the body or the subject of the message so that when an end user receives the email and clicks the link, we do a scan in real time. So we protect that link in real time, on click and every click, and from any device because we've modified that within the mail itself. We also have a unique feature within this service uh, which we call dynamic user awareness, and that's aimed at building the human firewall that Orlando mentioned. So uh, creating this sort of mindful um, or mindfulness in end users, um, driving a mentality of caution. So user awareness um, links in directly with the URL rewriting engine and can be configured by the administrator so that for a percentage of clicks that users make from links in their emails, rather than um, being taken to the website they're trying to access or being blocked if it's a bad site. Instead, the user will be shown a page in their browser uh, which shows them some more information about the email they received, some more information about the link, and then where that link actually goes. And then we ask them a very simple question, which is, what do you think? Do you want to accept the risk and continue? Um, or do you want to exit? And the idea being that we put this speed bump in for the user. Um, it's not for every click, it's a percentage of clicks. So that means that when users see this, it makes them stop and think. And the idea over time is to drive this mentality of caution so that when users are outside email, if users are in the web browser or in Gmail or another uh, webmail service, for example, they'll stop and think before they click. From the administrator's point of view, we track user decisions so um, we can help administrators and uh, and compliance teams to build up a picture of the most high-risk users within the organization. And then those users can be targeted offline for more effective security training. The second service component, Attachment Protect, deals with weaponized attachments. And really, we do that um, in the only way, really, that, that these attachments can be effectively analyzed, which is to open the attachment in a sandbox. But as with all things Mimecast, we like to do things a little differently and put some innovation to our service. So we have two modes of configuration. So we provide um, more traditional sandboxing capabilities, and this is what we call preemptive sandboxing. So in that workflow, as an email comes inbound through the Mimecast gateway, if the mail contains an attachment that could be weaponized, so things like Microsoft Office files or PDF files, We'll take the attachment, we'll hold the email, we'll take the attachment, and we'll put it into our full system emulation sandbox. So that's a complete emulated hardware and software environment that's spun up um, on the fly specifically for the purpose of opening and observing the behavior of the file. So by that process of observation, we can very easily and quickly determine if the file is safe or unsafe. So if it's safe, We'll uh, put it back into the email and deliver the email with the original copy of the attachment to the end user. But obviously, if it's unsafe, we'll block access and prevent that from being delivered to the end user. Now, 
that type of preemptive sandboxing comes with an offset, and that offset is latency. So by stopping the mail, by opening the file, by going through that process of observation to a level where we can be um, very confident that the file is safe or unsafe, takes a few minutes, and that equates to a delay or a few minutes delay in the delivery of email. So we recognize that that's not for everyone. So we built um, and you have available as a targeted threat protection customer a second workflow, which is what we call on-demand sandboxing. And that comes with our unique transcription technology. So in that workflow, and this is one which can be configured for all users or a subset of users in conjunction with preemptive sandboxing, as emails pass inbound through the Mimecast gateway, again, we stop the email, we hold the email, we take the attachment, but rather, um, instead of putting it into the sandbox straight away, what we do is we transcribe the contents. So essentially, we take the contents of the file, and we move it to a different file, a new file, and a new file type. So by lifting and shifting the content, we essentially shrug off any embedded code, any macros, and very quickly create a safe file that we can deliver onto the end user. So you'll see the example here. Um, now, in a lot of cases, and what we find um, in live usage is that that's where the workflow will end. Just because the person was sent uh, an editable attachment doesn't necessarily mean they need to receive it in an editable format. If they're happy to receive it as read-only, that's where the workflow ends. But obviously, we recognize that um, for some users, there is a need to have the editable original. So we also cater for that. So in this workflow, uh, you'll see in the screenshot here, there's a set of instructions attached, and if the end user opens those instructions, they can request the original file. And at that point, the file is put into our sandbox. It goes through the same level of deep security observation, and then if clean, is delivered onto the end user. But the key thing to bear in mind here is that by providing the user with the email and with a safe copy of the attachment, we've bridged that latency gap that's created by more traditional sandboxing. And lastly, the third, and at the moment possibly the most important part of the targeted threat protection suite is impersonation protect. And this deals with uh, the kind of whaling or business email compromise threats that um, Orlando articulated earlier on. So we've built this service essentially to be able to identify those kind of emails. And we do that by looking for um, commonalities or what we call identifiers in those emails. And the administrator can define a threshold. So if a certain number of these identifiers are met, then an action can be taken. So some of the identifiers we're looking at, uh, for example, are the username. And again, be mindful and think here about what these emails are trying to do. They're trying to, um, that they're designed to look like they come from an internal user who works for that organization. So the username will usually be the username of the person or of somebody from the company. The domain may be very similar to uh, the company's domain, but maybe one or two characters out, so that that is an attempt to fool the end user uh, or the recipient into thinking that it's a real email address. Often, even though there are back and forth replies with these emails, at some point the email will have to ask for what it is the attacker wants. So in the early iterations of these attacks, we saw them as being very much financially motivated. So. Um, keywords like wire transfer, bank transfer, chaps um, were included. But obviously we've seen these attacks move on and now, um, especially in the US, are uh, targeting data rather than, um, than currency. So things like W2s, the US equivalent of the UK P60, um, are often requested. And one of the other important indicators um, which ties back to that um, domain is how new the domain is or is it newly observed? So if you look at these, uh, these attacks, what we often find is that the domain is registered, um, usually very quickly on, uh, on the day of the attack, and then used, and then discarded, um, often with stolen credit card details. So there's a period of time um, after um, the purchase with the stolen credit card details that the attacker has to use that domain before uh, the domain registrar realizes that it's, uh, it's been paid for with stolen, um, stolen credit card details, and then shuts it down. So, we often find that these domains don't have any history, so they're, uh, they're newly observed. So by creating a policy um, within the Mimecast administration console, the administrator in an organization can define a threshold, so how many of these things and other identifiers need to be matched uh, before an action can be taken. And then they can define uh, a set of actions. 
So in its most aggressive form, uh, the technology can bounce the message so we can just reject it in protocol and not deliver it at all. Alternatively, the message can be held for either an administrator or for a group of moderators to review. Um, it can even be held for the user themselves to review as part of our uh, message digest email. And to really make it clear to the end user, we also mark the message as suspicious. And this works particularly well if you allow the message to, uh, to reach the user's inbox. So the administrator can choose to mark the message subject, the message body, and also the headers as well, the SMTP headers, so that things like Outlook rules or Exchange rules can be used to take very custom actions on these kind of emails. And what's very important with these mails is that we mark them as being, A, suspicious, but secondly, um, as coming from an external source, because don't forget these mails are designed to look like internal emails. So by marking them as external, it becomes then very clear to the user that they're not talking to their own CFO or CEO, they're talking to somebody outside the organization. So just to recap before we take some questions, 95% of all data breaches um, in the last year started with a spear phishing or a phishing email. And this will stay constant or even increase because um, attackers will modify and will polymorph their, uh, their attack vectors and will continue to use email because it's an easy attack vector. The Mimecast targeted threat protection suite um, is designed to directly address all of the issues um, that you see today and tomorrow in these kind of attacks. So thank you very much. We'll pass back to Amy for, uh, for some questions. Okay, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Orlando. Um, so, so if you do have any questions, um, you can just pop those in the questions box and I'll read those um, out shortly. Okay, so Greg's um, just asked for a copy of the webinar, and that's fine. I'll send you all a link to the recording this afternoon. Um, so we have a question here from Rob also. Um, he's asked, is Mimecast targeted threat protection additional to the, to the normal Mimecast license? And so, yeah, it does form an advanced security package, yes. Okay, so I think that's it for questions. Um, so thanks everyone for joining and taking the time out of your busy days. And also thank you, uh, Steve and Orlando, for presenting today. Um, so I will send you all a link to the recording um, this afternoon. And uh, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.